It's a beautiful day today, not only because it's nice and cold, which I love, it's Mother's Day. It's a day in which we celebrate mothers and what their influence is over our lives. If we all think back and we think about um, the role our mums have played in our lives, they're, they're enormous. So I want to I wanna just give you a couple of um, poems that talk about the love of a mum and, and, and how much she means to us and, and that we'll, we'll never be able to uh, uh, um, pay her for all that she's done for us. And I'm sure she wouldn't want us to pay her because that's her great joy is to, is to be there for us. This one's called Sunshine. My mother, my friend, so dear. Throughout my life, you're always near. A tender smile to guide my way. You're the sunshine to light my day. Second one is a mother's love. Of all the special joys in life, the big ones and the small, a mother's love and tenderness is the greatest of them all. Blessing. There is no blessing quite so dear as a mum like you to love year after year. Aren't those beautiful? Aren't those true of the, the wonderful blessing a mum is? And this is a wish for you. Just one little wish for you, mum. But it's loving and happy and true. It's a wish that the nicest and the best things will always keep coming to you. Isn't that what we hope, not only for ourselves, but especially for our mums? Our mums have always been the most tender person in our life, the person that you could go to. I remember growing up, um, uh, my dad was quite a disciplinarian, and boy, oh boy, did I get hidings. I'm, I deserved most of them. Um, <laughs> not all of them, but most of them, you know. Them. Um, but, you know, when my mum used to discipline me, that used to hurt the most when, when she would. And it never, it wasn't the physical, it was the emotional part that really hurt the most. So speaking about mums, um, one of the first things that comes to mind when I think of a mum is wisdom. Is, is, is the wisdom that she exudes over her family as she takes her family and she looks after her children one by one, no matter how many children there are, um, she will look after them and love and cherish each one of them because each one of them are so different and each one of them are so, so close to her heart. Now that's a mother, that's an earthly mother, that's, that's somebody we, we, we live with day in and day out. Now, now think of that wisdom and multiply it by an incountable number. And that's the wisdom that God exudes over our lives. The wisdom that he brings to bear on, on our thoughts, on the process uh, that, we, that we have in our lives every single day. I can still, after so many years, when I want to do something that is kind of not pleasing to my parents, I can hear my mom's voice in the back, Bruce, no, <laughs> that's not the right thing to do. That's the wisdom that she would give me and the principles and the, and the knowledge that she would give me, which would later on transform into into wisdom over time. Over time, I would see the, the folly of, 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 of what I would do and understand the implications and the consequences that would happen if I would persist in that line. And I would understand that my parents would want to bring me back to, 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 to that, that, that pathway where they want me to walk, where, where it's, it's, it's um, not going to be detrimental to anybody else uh, and also not yet detrimental to myself. And I think that's where we are right now in the book of James. James is, is such a wise man and he, and he gives such wisdom, but he would be the first to acknowledge that that wisdom is not of himself. It doesn't come from himself. It comes from his, his Lord, his Savior, Jesus Christ, who, is, who has got passion for people. I mean, so much so that, that we just celebrated Easter, that he, he died on a cross how much compassion do you need to show to a person to show that you love them so much than giving your life? But not only giving your life, but, but then rising from the dead to complete salvation's plan for each one of us. So please open your Bibles to that passage in James. Um, last week we talked about taming of the tongue and we came to an understanding of, 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 of the tongue is, is, is an evil thing and an evil th thing that, that is in our mouths and constantly trips us up as we go along. But we know that, that, that the tongue gets the blame but the heart is the culprit. 
The heart that we have, that, that, that beats inside of us, that, that is the, the center of reasoning, the center of understanding in our lives, is the thing that really is the problem. And if there's no change in heart, there's no change in speech, there's no change in life, and there's no wisdom. Because God will give you wisdom. He will, he will, if you will ask, and you are genuine about what you want from the Lord, He will give it to you. He doesn't deny anybody anything. But he wants to give. We all know the, the story of Solomon and the wisdom that he got from God, not only because, because he desired it, but because he knew that if, if he didn't have the wisdom of God at that particular time when, when he was going to ascend the throne, he knew that the kingdom would be absolutely done for. He looked at his father and he saw, even though his father David committed so much sin and so much bloodshed entered into the family because of David, he knew that if, if he did not have wisdom, if he didn't have the, 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 the God's wisdom in his life, he would be in huge, huge trouble. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, what is wisdom? And where does it come from? I want you to keep these, 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 these questions in your mind. So that's number one. What is wisdom? Where does it come from? Number two, what is knowledge? And where does knowledge come from? Number three, what is understanding? And where does understanding come from? And lastly, what are the attributes of wisdom? What are the attributes of wisdom? If you think of wisdom and, 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 and you make a list, what does it actually look like? Well, I want to I go through a couple of verses and then get into James. Um, so uh, this is just a couple of verses from, from the Old and New Testament, which, which will answer some of those questions, but will also open up further questions. Job 12 verse 12 says, Is not wisdom found among the aged? Does not long life bring understanding? Job, Job is he's, he's asking, this, this question is asked and, 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 and there's no real answer that comes in. And you would think that, that if a person has lived a long life and a, and a life that is, is, is studious in studying God's word, that wisdom would accompany them in, in, in that journey. And it says, does not a long life bring understanding? Not always. Sometimes we are so steeped in our sin and in our problems that understanding escapes us, that wisdom escapes us. Psalm 37 verse 30 says, The mouths of the righteous utter wisdom, and their tongues speak what is just. The mouths of the righteous. What is a righteous person? Well, a righteous person is somebody who has been redeemed by God, who's been bought at a price uh, by Christ, but then not only that, then follows Christ Jesus day by day. Obedience to Christ is righteousness. He gives us the will, the, the, the go to be righteous people. We can be obedient if we listen, if we learn, we can be obedient. And what is the result of, of that righteousness? Is utter wisdom. And if your, your heart is full of wisdom, then your tongue will speak what is right. So, so there needs to be a transformation inside, and that leads to, leads to wisdom. Proverbs 1 verse 7, you've heard this a million times. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord, it's not a fear of, of I don't know what he's going to do, it's a fear of, it's an awe. It's a, this is a God who has is, who is wrought salvation from the beginning of time. This is a God who, who knows you, who knows your heart. He sees right into every thought, every motivation that you have. And if we are, are to be people according, called according to his name and have knowledge in our hearts, he's able to then take that and make it into wisdom. But fools despise the wisdom and instruction. God instructs us through his word. That's why he's given us his word. To instruct us on, on, on life and how we are to um, deal with our finances, deal with our home, deal with our children, deal with people around us, our family, our friends, deal with work. As we come to work, what are we supposed to do? 
If we, if we despise wisdom and instruction from the Lord, then we are fools. And that's what Scripture says. Proverbs 3 verse 7 says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Don't think that you've got it all down pat. The wisdom that we sometimes have puffs us up and makes us proud because it's our own. And we think, man, I am so good. Look how wise I am. But if you're wise in your own eyes, you're in for a big fall. Scripture says, fear the Lord and shun evil. Push evil away. Shun it. Run. I was speaking to a young man who was getting into trouble a lot. And I said to him, do you know the story of Joseph? And he's like, who's Joseph? (laughs) So I had to speak to him about Joseph. And um, I got to the stage where I said to him, um, part of his wife wanted to have her way with him because he was this handsome young guy and, you know, he was really dark tanned and buff and all that kind of thing. And, and she grabbed him and um, grabbed his, 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 his clothes and he ran like crazy. He was just out of there like a bolt. I said, that's what you've got to do. You've got to do a Joseph. <laughs> you've got to run like crazy. Shun evil. Get out of there. Don't stand around. Don't be tempted by evil. And so Proverbs 3 verse 7 says, Fear the Lord and shun evil. And here's a really important one that we dealt with already, but we'll come back to it. James 1 verse 5. And if, you, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Ask. Ask and you will receive. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Understand that that God wants to give you wisdom. He wants to give you knowledge and understanding of what you are going through so that you make the right decisions, so that you walk the right path. And he doesn't just give a little bit. He doesn't just give a little bit and sees what you're going to be doing with it. He gives generously, abundantly, more than you can even think. If you are truly asking and wanting wisdom, he'll give it to you. Ephesians 5, 15 to 16 says, Be careful how you live or walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time. The days are evil. Understand that these days that we are living in, you, you, you know are evil. That every intent of the heart of man is towards evil. It's not towards God. If we drifted towards God, it would be a wonderful thing. But if we're standing still, we are drifting the other way. We are drifting towards unrighteousness. Okay, so now let's get into the passage. So now we've got an understanding of, of knowledge, of wisdom, of understanding Let's have a look at this passage, James 3, 13 to 18. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going through a book at the moment. It's by Chuck Swindoll, and he is just a phenomenal Bible expositor. And um, I always used to listen to him on the, on, on, on the radio, and I still love his podcasts. I listen to it. And um, this one is about, about James. And um, Larry, if you can put up the first slide there. Um, this, please excuse the, what it looks like. Um, it's from a book and I just took a photo of it but I wanted you to understand this as I go through this I want you to look at that and and come to an understanding of what's going on so first what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at what are the signs of the unwise um, 3 verse 14 then we're going to look at the characteristics of the unwise uh, 3 verse 14 15 then we're going to look at what are the ultimate results of the unwise people so as you can see Um, It goes from the the, the inside out to to the outside. So here we go. Number one, Um, what are the signs of the unwise? He says bitter jealousy, if you look in in the scripture. Jealousy that harbors hard feelings. That's what Chuck Swindoll says. Hard feelings. Something that that is deep, that it's it's seated inside of you. I don't know if you, you know bitter people. You know, people that that are just so bitter that when you spend five minutes in their presence, you kind of just got to get away because it's it's contagious. It just it just gets onto you. I was um, I do goalkeepers at at uh, Capalaba, and I train them, and and we had the the 18s, the 20s, and the first team playing last night. So I warm up the goalkeepers, and 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 a lady that I got to know through another football club was there, 
And, um, and, and, and she's an incredibly negative lady. A lot of hard stuff she's gone through, but she's incredibly negative. And, and, and within five minutes, I just had to, I just had to walk away because it was just negativity and bitterness and no forgiveness in their life. And that's what, that's what James is saying. It's, it's not just bitterness and it's not just jealousy. It's bitter jealousy, deep-seated, deep down. God, you are not going to touch it. This is my creation and I don't care what you do. I'm going to be a bitter so-and-so and I don't care about the world. What's happening down, deep down in your heart? Is there some, somebody that you're harboring unforgiveness against? Is there, is there, is there somebody that, that, that has done something so awful to you that you cannot forget or forgive them? It breeds bitter jealousy. It's like a cancer that starts small but starts to metastasize and it gets bigger and bigger and soon your whole life is taken over by this jealousy of what somebody else has done to you and you look again and you don't even recognize yourself after a while. But that's not the end of it. Selfish ambition. Hunger to push yourself to the top no matter what happens or who gets hurt. It doesn't matter who you're going to step on, who you're going to tramp on to get to the top, but I am going to get to the top and I don't care. Selfish ambition. Notice that, that, those, that those are the signs, but let's look a bit deeper. If you look to the outer side, arrogance, to exalt over others, uh, justifying your sinful actions. I'm going to justify my sinful actions and I'm going to be arrogant about it. I don't care who comes in my way. I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them who I am. Number two, dishonest. Change truth to suit their circumstances. Do we do that? When people say something and it, it kind of strikes a chord with you and you, and you rile up, and you change the, the, the truth of the matter so that you look like the one that's coming out on top? Understand that, that, that the, the character, characteristic that, that is one of the worst here is number three, worldly. Worldly ambition inside your heart. Thinking of the here and now, not of the eternal. What am I going to gain right here, right now? James says that is one of the most unwise things you can do is, is to leverage today in spite of what eternity has got. Saying, I don't care what the future brings, but the here and now is what I want and I'm going to get it and I'm going to take it with both hands and I don't care who I hurt. Number four, natural. Our own thoughts, attitudes, interests. This, this, this world is, is all there is. I'm going to die, and then there's nothing after that. The atheists love that one. They love to be natural. How can you talk about an afterlife? What proof do you have? The Bible? Come on. It's just a supernatural fairy tale. That's all it is. And then fifthly, characteristic of the unwise is demonic. It's a philosophy that is contrary to God's truth. Demonic, something that is, is from the very pit of hell, wanting to pull you away from where Christ wants you to be and wants to distract you. So what are the results of being unwise? What are the results of being unwise? Many years ago, an incredible thing happened which changed um, the life of the charismatic movement forever. In, I think it was the early 80s, um, in Toronto, there was a thing called the Toronto Blessing that happened. And people were rolling on the floor. Um, they were going absolutely crazy, just absolutely crazy. It's more of a curse. They called it a blessing, a Toronto blessing. People were running around, throwing up, braying like donkeys, so-called laughing in the spirit, drunk in the spirit. 
It's actually a, 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 a thing from Hinduism called the Kundalini spirit that entered the church at that time. It has gone on to um, get into every part of the charismatic movement. God is a God of order. He does not like disorder. And in that moment, disorder reigned over that church. And it spread. People with the knowledge of the Toronto blessing went to other churches, to the vineyard churches, and, and wider, and it spread all over the world. Understand that God is not a God of disorder. Satan preys upon chaos, confusion, disharmony, antagonism, pettiness. That's what Satan craves to sow within us. Disunity, where we're not standing together under the banner of Christ. Total disorder. And it says every kind of evil. The root cause is our sin. And every kind of evil just flows from that. Our decisions are based on self-centered motivation. That's being unwise. And if you have a look at that, you see how one leads to the other. And so that concentric circle is the same as throwing a, 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 a pebble into a, into a still pond. And you see those ripple effects. It will have an effect on your life. If you start with the middle two, it'll go to the outsides. And before you know it, there's disorder and every kind of evil in your life. That's the negative. That's what, what James wants to highlight. He says, understand that, that this is the negative. This is what Satan wants to push you towards. But understand that there's something better, something much greater in a person's life. And I want you to know it. Let's go to the other slide, Larry. Now you can see where Christ wants us to be. If you start from the inside and you work out, let's have a look at that. What are the signs of the wise? Understand that this is the positive. This is the things we've got to strive towards. One of the signs is good behavior. Demonstrates their wisdom to make the right decisions. Make the right decisions. How do we know how to make the right decisions? God implants his word into our hearts. He, he transforms our minds, our lives to understand Number two, gentle, uh, gentle deeds, kind heart, compassionate, empathy, feeling for others. Do you know when you, when you meet somebody, they just go out their way to do something for somebody else? It is incredible to see those people. You want to be around those people. You want to you spend time with them because you know that, that, that it's going to rub off on you. And you want to be compassionate. And you want to you give of yourself, of your money, of your time, of everything. So that people can see not only who you are, but who Christ is. What are the characteristics of the, unwise, of, of the wise? A purity that's in your life. Because Christ wants us to be pure and holy, as Peter talks, talks about. Holy as God is holy. Purity is something we need to desire. Purity of thought. Purity of motive as we do things. Purity of deeds. Secondly, peaceable. That we are not peacekeepers, but we're peacemakers. If we're peacekeepers, we are, it doesn't matter. You, uh, let's, just, let's just stay together. No, peacemakers is let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's, let's open this wound up so that it can be healed. Don't let it fester. Gentle. Being gentle. Jesus was that kind of person. He wasn't weak. He was meek. It was power under control. That's Jesus. Reasonable. Be reasonable. When you think about things, reason it out. But not according to what you think, but what accord, according to Scripture says. Scripture has got such a way of, of taking our thoughts and molding them into something that is intelligible. That when we speak, we speak sense, being reasonable. Number five, merciful. Show mercy, just as, as, as uh, in, in Christ Jesus, God showed mercy to us. Let's be merciful to others. Unwavering, sincere. You want to be around those people. And what are the results of being wise? 
righteousness. What does righteousness mean? Being made right with Christ. Your sin being dealt with. You standing before God as if you'd never sinned through the eyes of Christ. That is righteousness. Acting the way you have been saved. And peace. Now that's, that seems like a very strange thing to talk about. Peace. Why peace? Well, if we've got peace in our hearts, it's because Christ has, has wrought that peace. He's brought that peace into our lives. And if we've got peace with Christ, we've got peace with God. And once we've got peace with God, we can have peace with our brothers and sisters. Because we want to know what is wrong, so that we can fix it, so that our relationships are stronger. Much, much stronger. Please understand that this, this, this portion of Scripture, these six verses, are not separate from what we uh, uh, talked about last week. We spoke about the tongue and the heart, and the, the tongue gets the blame, but the heart is the culprit. Understand, number one, that God's wisdom causes our heart to change, and then we change. First of all, it starts within us. And then it, it flows throughout our whole body. And our tongue is changed. And our minds are changed so that we know what God wants of us. And then secondly, earthly wisdom contains anger, bitterness, je jealousy, self-centeredness, factions, etc. Romans 12 verse 2 is, is so important. And, 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 and I hope and pray that, that you, can, you can learn uh, verses 1 and 2 because they are, they are so, so important. Verse 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. This world has got a pattern. And if we conform to this pattern, we're going to go down the way of, a, of, of, of worldliness, of envy, of malice, of every kind of evil. It says, be, but, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's a transformation that has to happen. That if our minds are renewed, then we know what Christ wants of us. Because we are so close to Him, that we're spending time with Him, moment by moment, day by day. Listening to His Word. Listening to sermons. Reading His Word. It's time in prayer, where we forsake everything else. Where we write in our diary, this is my time of prayer. This is my quiet time. And I don't care what happens in the world. But I'm going to keep that and it's not going to go by the way. Let God through His Holy Spirit so transform your heart and your mind, your thoughts are like His thoughts. And you say, Bruce, well, why do this? That by testing you may discern what is the will of God. If you understand His Word and it so transforms your heart and He tests you and He puts you through trials, He'll bring you to an understanding that... that, that he is sovereign above everything else and above everyone else. And He's able to protect you and guide you through this life. And He'll show you what is good and acceptable and perfect. Remember that Jesus wants us to be mature in Him. And that's what Paul, um, in many of his, his, his letters, he says, May I present them mature in Christ Jesus. That's his longing, and I think that's every pastor's longing too for, for, for the people in his congregation, is to say, hey people, we need to be mature in Christ Jesus. No longer sucking on milk, but eating the wonderful, wonderful steak of the Word. Taking big chunks and digesting them, and letting them be part of our lives so that we can live accordingly. We can take that knowledge, take that wisdom, apply it to our lives, and understand what it means for us. He wants us to be spotless, blameless, perfect. James wants the same for the first century believers, and he wants the same for us today. If James were here, and he would speak to us, I would love to sit right there and listen to him. But this is what he would be saying. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Be mature in Christ Jesus. You're a new creation. No longer in, in condemnation. Understand that you are, if you are saved, if, you, if Jesus' blood has been applied to your life, that you no longer stand in condemnation. Romans 8 says, it starts with that, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Understand that. That is so important. Understand too that time or circumstance doesn't diminish God's plan for us. 
Understand that this time that you're in in your life doesn't diminish what God's plan is for your life. Understand the circumstances, no matter how hard they are, no matter what disease you've got, no matter what financial problems you face, no matter what, what problems are in your family, what your family faces, it doesn't diminish God's salvation plan for your life. Circumstances doesn't change who God is. Nothing does. God is God and we are not. Understand that. As it was in the days of James, so it is now. Be wise. Be wise, not in your own eyes, but in and through God's wonderful word. Let's pray together. Father, how we long to be wise. How we long to have Scripture change us forever. How we long to have Scripture come and, 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 and just pierce our hearts through your Holy Spirit. Lord, open our eyes to the wisdom that is available if we would only ask. Help us, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that your Spirit would, would do his work in our hearts and, and we would not resist that work. That your love would be found deep within us and would change us forever. Oh, Lord God, help us. Lord, we, we have no one and we have nothing but you. Be merciful to us. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen.